Um, what I'd like to do today, actually, is to try to take those two areas that Chen just talked about and bring them together. And I began the, <clears throat> and in a way, take the work that I began in graduate school with my advisors, Lila Gleitman and Rochelle Gelman, and try to make a unified whole of it, show you how that work has changed over 50 years um, and how it has hopefully matured. So the question I want to ask is really about um, language and thought. So let me share my screen. All right, good. Yes, all righty, perfect. All right, let me. Okay, so I want to, as I just said, um, talk uh, frame this within language and thought. Um, and many people believe that language is absolutely essential to thought. Um, and the extreme view is that if you don't have language, you can't think. Now, of course, I think we all know that this extreme view is wrong on many counts. And what I'm gonna to try to do today is highlight one of them. Um, God, nothing is working, come on. Now it won't advance. Oh, okay. Here we go. Children who, who aren't exposed to language can invent one and they use their hands to do so. So their minds are shaping their language. It's not the other way around. Um, the first part of my work and my talk focuses on the mind hidden in hands that are creating language. But most of us do have a language that we've learned from others. So what do we do with our hands? Well, we move them as we speak, we gesture, and those gestures often reveal thoughts we don't know we have. So the second part of my work and my talk focuses on the mind hidden in hands accompanying language. So I'm going to sort of divide my life into two boxes here, the mind hidden in hands creating language and the mind hidden in hands accompanying language. So let's begin um, by imagining a far-fetched scenario. I want you to think about a world in which all languages, spoken, signed, written, disappear from the earth, they're gone, but everything else is unchanged. And the question I want you to think about is, would we expect language to reemerge as we currently know it? So if we're languageless and we are then forced to reinvent it, would we? And I think the answer to that depends on how we think language came about. If language looks the way it does because it's been handed down from generation to generation, it might not reemerge because there's nothing to go off of. But if language looks the way it does because it reflects how we communicate and how we structure communication, it might well reemerge and it might have the properties found in current day languages. That's the question I wanna ask. And it's basically asking how resilient language is. Was it a one-time invention? Did it happen only once? Or did it happen several times? Is it a system that can be reinvented de novo? Okay, so the first study of this sort of the resilience of language was um, done quite a long time ago um, and described by Herodotus in 429 BC. And he describes um, a, an argument between an Egyptian king and a Phrygian king. And the argument, surprisingly enough, was about whether, which was the natural language? What was the original language? I don't know why the kings cared, but they did care. Not surprisingly, the only languages they considered were Egyptian and Phrygian. <laughs> My dog who's commenting. <laughs> um, so what, what they did was they decided this, uh, this momentous question on the basis of data and experiment rather than battle. They took two, two children and put them in the babies from birth. They knew they needed two. Um, and they put them in the custody of a shepherd and sent the shepherd out into the hills and told the shepherd to take care of them and feed them and give them water and make sure they were happy, but never to utter a word to them. And he did. In 18 months, the kings came back. They looked at the children. They found that both children produced the word of dekos, which means bread in Phrygian. 
And the conclusion of this experiment was that Phrygian is the original language. Okay. Now there the matter has rested for quite some time because this is a tough study to replicate. Even before the IRB got serious, this is a tough study to replicate. Okay, let's see. <laughs> My computer doesn't want to go full. There it is, all right. Okay, so we can't replicate this study by experimentally depriving children of language. We don't want to do that. But we can take advantage of an experiment of nature. So we can look at children who are deprived by circumstance of linguistic input. And the question is, can such a child reinvent language? But of course, the hard part is who, who is deprived of linguistic input? Everybody's got linguistic input. But in fact, there are some children whose deaf children, whose hearing losses prevent them from learning a spoken language. And this was, I started this work well before there were cochlear implants, there are hearing aids, but the children were unable to um, make use of the hearing aids to acquire spoken language. In addition, all of these deaf children were born to hearing parents and their hearing parents knew no sign language and really didn't even know another deaf person. And they didn't expose their children to a sign language. So, the children are, for all intents and purposes, lacking linguistic input. What do they do? They might choose not to communicate at all, but in fact, they do communicate, and they turn to gesture to do so. These gestures are called home signs. So let me give you an example of a home sign system. This work was begun with Lila Gleitner and Heidi Feldman. Here is a deaf child of hearing parents. This is a very old video taken on real to real in black and white, so it's going to be not your screen. The child is sitting there looking at a picture book. It's a Richard Gary best word, world, word book ever book. And it's a picture of a shovel stuck in sand. And what he does is he starts to tell us about shoveling, goes off, and then he sort of gets an idea. He starts talking about snow shovels, not sand shovels. And he tells us that the shovels can be used when they're outside um, and when it snows and when you pull your boots on and um, they're kept downstairs. And he just goes on and on and tells us all about shovels with his hands. Shovel, shovel. Amen. Now, in the winter time, oh, winter time. Yeah. Yes. Outside. And it's snowing. Oh, it's snowing. Oh, we got a shovel. Right. Oh, I see. Where's the shovel? Where is it? There it is. Downstairs. Oh, there's the shovel. Oh, there. That's Heidi Feldman in the. Yeah. So. When we first discovered these kids, Heidi, Lila, and I, we sort of expected each child to structure their language. We went in with the thought that children might structure communication, but we didn't think that children would structure their communication in the same way. And it turned out that they did. So we're a little surprised by that. And we thought, well, maybe what's happening is that there are cultural pressures pushing the children towards structuring their language in a particular way. So we decided when I came to Chicago that what we should do is expand um, our set of home signers and start to look at deaf children of hearing parents in another culture. So here's a deaf child born to hearing parents in Taiwan. She's actually looking at the same picture book, but she's chosen a different picture to talk about. She's talking about a swordfish. And what she says is that the, or gestures, what the swordfish can pierce you through the heart and it can make you dead. This is an emblem in Taiwan. It's used by hearing people in the same way that in America we use thumbs up and okay. This means dead. It can pierce you through the heart and can make you dead. It has a long nose and it swims. You can see as her hearing sister comes in front of her that this sign language that she is inventing is used interactively because she says that swordfish can pierce you dead, pierce you through the heart and also make you dead. Oh, she actually pushes a little harder than she needs to in saying that 
swordfish can make her sister dead, but it's clear that they use this interactively. Okay. So when we looked at these children, a bunch of children in America and a bunch of children in Taiwan, we found a number of properties that kept coming up over and over and over again. And these we've called the resilient properties of language because they can be invented without benefit of a language model. Properties at the sentence level, properties at the word level, and properties of language use. What I want to do is just give you an example of each one of them quickly. So in terms of sentences, what the children do is they don't really paint a picture in the air. They come up with particular gestures that are um, discrete. And once they've made these discrete gestures, they have to put them together. And it turns out they put them together in a structured way. So here's a child asking me to actually have a snack. And what he does is he points first at the grapes, then he does an eat gesture, and then he points at me. And it turns out that's the order that he and all the other children follow. They put patients or objects first, and then they do the action. He also tends to put agents last. And notice that's not English. That's not the order we follow in English. So he is not, even if he were able to pick up spoken language, he's not using it as a model. Okay. Um, at the word level, words in home sign are pretty stable and they can differ across cultures. So here's that same home signer doing eat again. I mean, if I asked you to do eat, you would do that too, particularly American children and American people. But eat in the Chinese home signer was, he would, they would also do this. But in addition, he does this, which is a representation of chopsticks. Yeah. Not a surprise. Yeah. Okay. And finally, um, I don't think that in terms of language use, I don't think that a child would ever invent a language to talk to himself or herself. But once you've invented a language to talk to somebody else, the children use it to talk to themselves. So here's the child, deaf child on the right, sitting there yet next to his sister and playing with clay, with Play-Doh. And he wants to, he's looking for a plastic knife. So he gets up and he's looking around. And what he does is he does a wear gesture like this, and then he points at himself. But he's not looking at anybody. He's looking around. It's as though he's saying, mm, where's my knife? Where's my knife? Okay. Without making eye contact with anybody. So he gets up, he does the wear gesture, and then he points at himself. And he's just not, not directing this toward anybody. Okay. So these linguistic properties at the sentence level, at the word level, in terms of language use, are there in all the children. But the big question that certainly bothered us and is probably bothering you is whether these linguistic properties were invented by the children themselves. It's certainly possible that the children, that the parents invented the gestures and the children learned the properties from them. Okay, so to explore that, we went to yet another culture, Nicaragua, um, where we got lots of input. We, the parents were much more willing to sit around with the kids and there were other cousins and uncles and aunts, it was a large group of people. So we could see what kind of gesturing the children saw. And we explored two structural properties found in home sign. These are two ways to go beyond simple propositions. So you saw before they pointed at the grape and then you did eat. But you could combine two propositions within the boundaries of a single sentence. So before you drop your hand, and that would be like a simple complex sentence. So here's an example. This is the Nicaraguan home signer producing a complex sentence. He points at the bean and then he does cut and then he points at the tomatoes and he does eat and he doesn't drop his hand to meet him. Okay, uh, so that's one way of going beyond a very simple proposition. Another way is to take that proposition and instead of adding another one, to add a proposition down below here under one of the nouns. So in other words, to elaborate one of the nouns. And what the children do is elaborate in a very simple way. So here, what the child is doing is first he says airplane, then he says mine, and then he says it's over there. Airplane, mine, over there. Airplane, mine. Okay, these are very simple structures, but they do have hierarchy in them. So a complex sentence and a complex noun phrase. Do the children invent them is the question. Okay, so we looked at the gestures that the home signers hearing families produced in the United States and Nicaragua 
while they were interacting with their children. And we, we analyzed these gestures in the same way that we analyzed the deaf children's gestures, that is without sound, because the kids can't hear the sound. So we're just looking at their gestures as though we were, they were produced without speech. Okay, so first what we did was we looked at the parents' gestures and analyzed for complex gestures, complex sentences, and we analyzed the kids' gestures in the same way. What you see here is Nicaragua on the left, United States on the right. Um, and I've shown you the proportion of gesture sentences that are complex. You can see in both cultures, the home centers in red produce more complex sentences than the hearing family members. Okay. This is even more striking for the complex noun phrases. The graph is organized in the same way. And because in the United States, the parents hardly do it at all, it's uh, very impressive that the you know, home centers are doing this. On the other hand, there's a lot of variability in the parents, there's a lot of variability in the kids, and it's possible that parents who do this a lot have children who do it a lot, and parents who do it a little have children who do it a little. So there is a relationship between parent and child. <clears throat> so we looked at individuals, looked at the relationship between the parents and the children, but in fact, we found none. So here's the data for complex sentences. On the x-axis, I have the hearing family members and how much they have, how many, have the proportion of their gesture sentences that are complex. On the y-axis, we have the home signers. And as you can see, there's no relationship at all. There's really, it's, it's not at all linear. It's more striking for complex noun phrases because so many of the parents produce none at all. And you can see in Nicaragua, that outlier over here, that's a parent who produced a lot of them had a child who produced none of them. So there's absolutely no relationship for complex noun phrases or for complex sentences between what the parents do and what the children do. Okay, so home centers can invent the rudiments of language. This isn't all of language, but it is the rudiments of language. The question of course is how far can a home center go toward inventing a fully fledged language? That's a hard question to answer. <coughs> Sorry, my voice still isn't perfect, but it's getting there. Okay. <coughs> it's possible that some aspects of language really do need to be handed down from generation to generation. In other words, home scientists can't do it on their own. These properties have to be changed in the process of learning. <clears throat> now, we can explore this question by looking at current day home lang uh, sign languages that are evolving. I'm going to resort to my, <clears throat> my halls, excuse me. Okay, so <clears throat> it turns out that sign languages grow out of home sign. All sign languages have grown out of home sign. And in Nicaragua, we have the opportunity to watch a new language emerge. So 40 years ago, home signers lived in their own little homes, hearing homes, because of the genetics of, of deafness in Nicaragua. Deaf people weren't born to other deaf people. So they were only home signers. But 40 years ago, they created a educational situation, a school in Managua, where they brought all the deaf children together, each them. Now, of course, they taught them Spanish, but which didn't work, but it did give the children an opportunity to come together, and that's when Nicaraguan Sign Language emerged. So what I want to look at next for a couple of properties of language is first home signers who are in a very interesting situation because they have represented them by a little egg, suggesting that they are in their own little worlds without people. They are interacting with hearing people, but as I just showed you, they're hearing, the hearing people are providing them with co-speech gesture, not with home sign. So they are producing home sign, but getting co-speech gesture back. They're a productive system, but not really a receptive system. When all the home signers came together, they could not only see home sign, uh, produce home sign, but they could also see it. So they were in a school all together, exposed to Spanish, which they weren't getting, but also exposed to each other's home sign and they created Nicaraguan Sign Language, the first cohort. Since then, other deaf children have come into the school and learned the sign language that cohort one created. 
And that has changed the sign language. So what we have is three stages of learning. We have creation by individuals, creation through communication, which the home centers really don't have, and creation through learning. So what I want to do first is give you an example of a property. It's a pretty abstract property that's found not only in home sign, but in all subsequent cohorts in all three of these situations. So look at these two events. They appear to be symmetrical. So we have high-fiving here, and we have two people punching each other. Okay. They're not actually both symmetrical. And in all languages, they're not treated the same. So in English, we can say John and Mary high five, but we can't say Robert and Nancy punched. That's just not allowed. You have to say Robert and Nancy punched each other because the high five event is a symmetrical event, whereas the punching event is a reciprocal event. A notion that is captured, it's a subtle notion and is captured in all languages. Do home signers do it? Well, we looked at the verb form, the way in which they represented the high fiving or the pun punching. We found two different forms that are used. You can use a mirrored form, which is sort of right, it's symmetrical. One side mirrors the other. And you can do that either for high fiving or for punching. Or you can use a non mirrored form and have it be more asymmetrical. Okay. And it turns out that the home signers and every subsequent generation uses a mirrored form for symmetricals. That's sort of not a surprise. But what is the surprise is that they use the non-mirrored form for reciprocals. It actually would be much clearer to represent reciprocal, two people punching each other at the same time like this. But in fact, what they do is they punch out and then they punch in. So they put two punches together to represent sequential punch punch to represent a simultaneous event. And one of the reasons we suspect that they don't use this simultaneous mirrored form is because it, they want to distinguish it from this simultaneous mirrored form. So this is a very abstract property of language, which is um, produced from the get-go in home signers, Nicaraguan one and in Nicaraguan two. Now what I'd like to do is give you an example of a property, the plural, which is generalized only in cohort two. That is when the language is learned. Okay. So in order to indicate more than one, this is a home signer who's going to uh, use discrete repetition. Actually, if I asked you to show me a bunch of cups, this is what you would do too. He does cup, cup, cup for three cups. Okay. But he can also do something else. And what he does he's, is he can indicate more than one <clears throat> with a plural marker. He can do ba -ba 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 -ba. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Right. And you can hardly even tell how many there are. And in fact, he does ba -ba 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 -ba. if there are three, if there's four, if there's two, if there's 10, it's the same movement. It seems to mean more than one. He never uses it for one. Okay. So we want to know how these two different forms were used. So we gave them no agent trials where the pens were sitting there in the on the table. And we also gave them agent trials where a hand came in and set down <clears throat> a whole bunch of pens. And we at, just asked the home signers and the other groups, what happened? What's going on here? So what you see first is in the no agent conditions, all three groups, home sign, NSL1 and NSL2, use both the discrete repetition and the plural in pretty much equal rates. But when you look at the agent trials, it starts to get different. The home sign doesn't use this plural in an agent situation. So it's not generalized in the same way as we might have expected. I and mean, why would it be different for agent and no agent trials? But it is not, it's more restricted. It's not as systematic. What about NSL1? Is communication enough to get this generalized? No. Mm -mm. Just talking to somebody else doesn't allow this to become a full-blown system. However, learning it does. So transmitting it from one generation to the next allows this plural form to generalize out across a variety of sentences. So what we have here is that it's only when home sign is transmitted to the next generation when it's learned that the plural is generalized. Okay. So what we see here in this example of home sign, two ways in which 
uh, a language created by the hands can inform us about the mind and language. Home sign gives us a window onto properties of language that are so resilient they can be invented by a child. These are the fundamental properties of mind that give shape to language. You don't need a language to get them. They give shape to language. Language doesn't give shape to them. In addition, the emergence of Nicaraguan sign language from home sign gives us a window into the factors that make language go beyond these fundamental resilient properties of language. And we can begin to explore the conditions that allow that. Do you need communication with somebody else? Have it be a give and take system? Do you need for the system to be transmitted to the next generation? And Nicaraguan sign language and other sign language like it can help us address that question. Okay, so language is resilient. Are other skills equally resilient? Before moving on to gesture as we, as it's used <clears throat> with speech, I want to address this question. We looked at home signers' understanding of number. Many people say that a uh, number was invented only once as opposed to language, which seems like it can be reinvented every generation. And we wanted to see whether home signers could invent number in a sense. Okay, so we gave them scenes of a bunch of objects. So for example, here's some sheep and some number of sheep run out of the pen. Right. And then we asked him to just gesture about this, sign it. And here's the home center doing it. This, he's pretty descriptive actually. It, it's quite easy to see what he's saying. Okay. So we wanted to know whether he was exact. I mean, was he good at capturing the number of objects? So on the X axis there, we knew how many objects were there. That's the target number. On the y-axis, what I have is the number of fingers that the, the home centers raised when they're talking about these objects. And as you can see, for one, two, three, and four, they're great. They really are very accurate. But five and above, they start to get approximate. So we have small exact numbers that they're very good at and large approximate numbers where they're pretty smushy. I mean, they get close, but not that close. Now, of course, they were given a limited time to respond here. And if I asked you to do this, you would look the same. So in fact, we did ask people like you to, to do this. We asked unschooled hearing controls and we asked signing deaf controls to do this. And they looked exactly the same as the home centers. They had small exact numbers and large approximate numbers. Okay, that's a, a limited time. But if I gave you an unlimited amount of time, you'd get much better at these large numbers, and in fact, you do it exactly. But the home signers don't. So the home signers look exactly the same when they have unlimited time as they look when they have limited time. Whereas the unschooled hearing controls start to clean it up and they have large exact numbers and the signing deaf controls have large exact numbers. What this suggests is that home sign can't invite large exact numbers and large exact numbers are really important to the number system. You're not going to have a number system that doesn't have exactness as you get um, as the numbers get larger and larger as the sets get larger and larger. So what I'd like to claim on the basis of this uh, study, and I've wanted to say this for many years, that language is more resilient than number. That language can be reinvented every generation but maybe number can't, or at least the all aspects of number. Okay, so we've talked about the mind hidden in the hands creating language. Now I wanna talk about the mind hidden in hands that accompany language. So language is resilient. When it can't come out of the mouth, it comes out of the hands. What do the hands do when the mouth is used for language? Well, of course they gesture, we know that. And all speakers gesture. This is a person who was asked by Jenna Iverson to just say how she got from one place to another, just to describe what's going on here. And you can just tell me everything walk. that will pass as we walk through. Okay, well, the front door, there's an entryway. And uh, so as, as soon as you enter the front door, you're going to see Dash's shoes on the right mm -hmm. on the floor because they're dirty, and so I don't take them in. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll, he'll come in and, you know, he'll, he'll bend down and pick them up in the room, <laughs> too. And he, he wags his tail. He's like, oh, you're so funny. And so, <laughs> so proud. <laughs> So there is nothing unusual about this woman's gestures, but there is actually something a little unusual about her, as many of you might have noticed by looking at the little dog to her side. She is blind 
and she is she is blind from birth. She's congenitally blind. Nonetheless, when she starts to talk, up come her hands, even though she's never ever seen anybody gesture. So all speakers gesture, even those who have never seen. So gesture is as maybe as resilient as language is. Okay. So the big question I'd like to ask is whether these gestures mirror hand waving. And um, what the answer is, is no, they're not just hand waving. They reflect what we know and they can even change what we know. So let me give you some examples. And this is a phenomenon that uh, Rochelle, I got from Rochelle Gelman when I learned about Piaget in conservation. She gave me a videotape of children doing conservation tasks. And what I noticed was that the children were gesturing a great deal. So Brecky Church looked at those gestures to try to figure out what they were doing with the gestures. So this is Piaget in conservation. Um, Piaget lays out two rows of checkers. I'm sure you all know this. Um, he asks the children if there's the same number or different number of checkers in the two rows. They say it's the same. And then he spreads one row out and says, are they the same or different number of checkers? And conservers, of course, you all say it's the same number of checkers. Don't be ridiculous. But what the non-conservers do is they say it's a different number. And what Piaget was interested in was why they said it's a different number. And what I'm interested in is not only what they say, but what they do with their hands. So here's a child who says they're different. And they're different because you spreaded them out. And as she's saying, spreaded them out, she's spreading them out with her hands as well. Okay, there you go. Uh, yes. Do these two rows of checkers have the same number of checkers? No. Which one has more checkers in Okay, so she's talking about spreading them out in her speech and in her gesture. We call this a gesture speech mask. Now look at this one. He is just as wrong as the other one. She, he also says they're different. And he says they're different because you moved them. But if you watch his hands, what he does is this. He pairs up the checkers in one row with another row. That's not how they were moved. They were spread out. What he's doing is he's giving some idea, some sense that he knows that pairing up the checkers is a good thing to do. Once you've done that, you're eventually going to get conservation. So here he goes. Do I always have the same number of checkers in them now? Um, why is that what you're Because you moved them. Okay. okay. So he's produced what we call a gesture speech mismatch. Talking about moving, gesturing about one-to-one -one correspondence. When we found kids like when Brecky found kids like this, which she only found by uh, turning off by coding speech and gesture sep separately. If you code speech and gesture together, it is very, very, very difficult to notice that gesture is saying one thing and speech is saying another. We just naturally integrate the two modalities. But if you code them separately you can find out that gesture is doing something different from speech in certain children. So we thought that those certain children might be more advanced or might be in a different state from the children who, who use the same speech and gestures. We gave them all instruction and conservation. And then we looked to see whether who learned after the, or who improved after instruction. So what I've shown you here is the proportion of children who improved on the post test. And, and the children in blue are the children who were mismatchers prior to instruction. The children in white are the children who were matchers prior to instruction. As you can see, significantly more mismatchers improved after instruction than matchers. Okay, so gesture in relation to speech, notice this is not gesturing or not gesturing. It's the relationship between gesture and speech that's telling us who's ready to learn. Maybe it's just about conservation. So we tried to extend this to a new task, a math task. Three plus four plus five equals blank plus five. It's pretty easy. However, fourth and fifth graders in America don't do so well with this problem. Um, and when they get it wrong, what they do is they add up all the numbers on the left side of the equation and they put that number in the blank, the 12, or they just add up all the numbers in the problem and they put that number in the blank. But of course, we know that you add up the three, the four, you put that. Okay. So here's a child who says that she added up the five and the four and the three. And what she does is she points at the five and the four and the three. 
Okay. So she's produced a match, talking about adding up numbers, gesturing about adding up numbers to the years. This child says exactly the same thing, but watch her hands because what she does first is she points at the five on the right and then points at the five and the four and the three. She has, in a sense, pointed at all of the numbers in the problem. So how do you get four? And so she's produced a mismatch. She's talking about adding up the numbers to the equal sign, but she's gesturing about adding up all the numbers. Again, we wanted to know whether these mismatchers were in a different state from the matchers. We gave them all instruction and looked to see how many learned. Um, and again, you can see the proportion of children improving on the post-test in math equivalence on the right, conservation on the left, and again, the mismatchers were more likely to pick up on the instruction and learn than the matchers. Okay, so gesturing reflects what speakers know. And again, it's not just moving your hands. It's the way in which you move your hands, particularly in relation to speech. So can, does gesture do more? Gesturing can also change what speakers know, which sort of, I think, gets it into pretty exciting stuff. And the way in which we can tell the gesture changes what speakers know is we have to manipulate it. We can't just let them gesture because we don't know if gesturing is reflecting or changing. So what we had to do is force or at least encourage children to gesture and tell them how to gesture. Okay. So we manipulated the gestures that children produce during learning. We taught one group of children to say, I want to make one side equal to the other side. It's an equalizer strategy for that math problem. And they were told to say these words before and after solving each problem, no gestures. Okay, so here's an example. Okay. We taught another group of children exactly the same words, but they were taught grouping gestures. And by that, I mean, they were taught to put a V hand under the two numbers that are unique on the left side and then to point at the blank, a grouping strategy, which we got from the children. We didn't invent that, they did. So first of all, you say the words and do the hand movements exactly like the practice. I want to make one hand to the other But notice that the difference between the, the no gesture and the gesture is not only a mismatching gesture, it's also movement versus no movement. So we wanted a third group was taught to produce the equalizer strategy in words, but producing a partially correct grouping strategy. What we told the children to do is to point at the wrong two numbers, put the V under the wrong two numbers, and then point at the blank. So in full disclosure, I really thought this was going to be a disaster, that when you're taught to point, to actually indicate the wrong two numbers, you're not going to get anything right. Um, because I thought gesture is so compelling as an indexical strategy. But it turns out that gesture does other things. Those gestures do other things. It tells you things about the problem. It tells you to group these two numbers. And, and then it also tells you that there are two sides of the problem by having these two different gestures. Those are important facts about the problem. So the question is, is this partially correct uh, strategy gonna be a total disaster, so it'll be worse than no gesture at all, or would the children be able to abstract out some of these partially correct bits of information? And it turns out, oh, here's the kid. I'll move one side equal to the other side. Okay, so it turns out that, um, as we suspected, if you did the correct gestures with the speech, you did the best on the problems in the post-test, better than no gesture. But if you did partially correct gesture, you were actually better than no gesture, which is interesting because it suggests that we all know that gesture sort of directs your eye and it, it makes you attend to certain things. But gesture does more than that. It doesn't just direct your attention. That is sort of exciting. Okay, why does gesturing change our minds? We don't really know the answer to that, but I'll tell you what we've been thinking about. Gesture is grounded in action, but it also represents information. It therefore has the potential to help learners transition from a concrete task 
to a more abstract understanding of the task. So we wanted to see if gesture could do that. And we did this by teaching children movements that vary in how grounded in action they are. So we taught them actions, concrete gestures, and abstract gestures to go along with these words. Let me give an example. Here's an example of the action that picked up the numbers and put it in the blank. <laughs> Okay, here's concrete gesture. What they did was they did exactly the same movements, just didn't touch the numbers. I want to make one fact equal to that And then the last one is the abstract gesture you saw before. Okay, so we had three different groups of children, action children, concrete gesture children, abstract gesture children. And we tested them in three different ways. First, we just tested them on the problems that were basically in the same format that they got. So they were trained on five plus seven plus four equals one plus four. And they got problems of exactly that same format, different numbers, but same format. Okay. And what happens is that they all learn, which is good because that action is a little weird. Um, and it's nice that the children did learn from either action, concrete gesture, or abstract gesture. There are no differences among the groups on the trained problems. But we also tested them on a problem that required transfer, generalization. We moved the blank to the other side, right? Notice that this is three plus eight plus two equals three plus blank. Now notice that if you do the two gestures, you know, if you just add the first two numbers and put that number in the blank, you're gonna get the problem wrong. Okay, so what happens? Turns out that the kids who, who did action get the problem wrong. They are unable to generalize beyond this, beyond the instruction they got. Whereas the children who got concrete gestures and abstract gestures were able to do so. And finally, we had the last thing we did, we took out the equal addends at all. So now you really have to understand that the two sides need to be made equal. And on the four trans far transfer problems, action's gone, concrete gestures fading, and abstract gesture is still pretty good. So what this suggests is that action helps kids learn the problems in which they're taught, but gesture helps them extend that knowledge to new problems, okay? Now, there are two possibilities underlying this. Gesture could be helping generalization or action could be hurting it. And these mechanisms are really hard to distinguish using behavior alone because they both result in the same behavioral outcome. So we're now turning to neuroimaging in the hopes that maybe we can pull this apart. So um, the study by, done by Liz Wakefield, after learning mathematical equivalents, kids solved the problems in the scanner. There was no movement involved at all. All of the children learned mathematical equivalents. They were either taught by gesture, gesture and speech or just by speech, okay? And what we found is that there was activity in the motor areas when the children had learned the problems um, through gesture and speech, but not through speech alone. So this is the, um, uh, the, the picture of what happens when you learn by gesture and speech minus or subtracting out when you learn by speech alone. What's interesting about it is that these are the areas activated by learning through gesture these are the areas activated by learning through action, not the actions in the math problems. This is studied by Karen James, but the areas are pretty comparable. It's sort of interesting. It's clear that gesture is leaving a motor signature, but what's also interesting is that they're not exactly the same. So we're hoping that we can explore these subtle differences to see um, whether um, the areas act that, to see whether learning via gesture can, um, See, to see whether learning via, via gesture helps um, activate areas that are in the generalization area, but learning via gesture, via action, grounds you in the particular. So we think that there are different areas of the brain that are responsible for abstraction and for sort of responding to a particular object. And we're looking to see whether both of those areas are activated or whether only one is activated, one for gesture and one for action. And we'll see, I don't know. So learning from action could tie the representation to a particular exemplar and learning from gesture could extend the representation to a more abstract form and both could be happening. 
but we'll, I'll let you know. All right, so we've looked at the mind hidden enhanced creating language, the mind hidden enhanced accompanying language. Now, the last question I'd like to address is whether signers hide their minds in their hands. And if so, they should gesture just like speakers, and it turns out they do. Um, so here's an example. Um, we asked speakers to describe objects that were so similar, the words can't capture the differences between them. So look at those vases. They're two yellow vases. And when it's really hard to describe, you know, you can talk about bumps, and one bump or two bumps or whatever, but it's not so easy to describe the differences. That's when speakers turn to gesture. So here's an example. Two different humps in the middle and at the bottom. Okay. Turns out signers also turn to gesture. Now, if you look at that signer, what's interesting about him is not just gesturing with his hands, he's also gesturing with his mouth. So take a look again. He does these little bumps with his mouth. Come on. That's something that hearing people never do, never. Um, so it's quite unique to signers. Okay. But the big question we want to ask was whether gesture has the same cognitive effects in signers and in speakers. And answering this question allows us to disentangle a sticky theoretical question. Because gesturing could lead to change either because it offers a second modality. So we often talk about two modalities being better than one. We have the oral and we have the manual, and they're both being used on these problems. But gesture offer also offers a second representational format. That is, two different formats are used at the same time. Gesture is much more mimetic and pictorial than, act, than ja, uh, languages, which is more discrete and categorical. And the two formats are used simultaneously. Now, notice we can't, make, we can't pull those apart for hearing people because they're using gesture in their mouths and um, language in their, sorry, uh, language, uh, language in their mouths and gesture in their hands. But for signers, we can. Signers do not use two modalities. They use hands for both, but they do use two representational formats. So the question is, do signers produce gesture sign mismatches? I mean, is that even possible? And do those mismatches predict readiness to learn? So let me take you back to mathematical equivalence and look at a deaf child using sign and matching gesture. So here is a deaf child who says just signs that you add all of them. And she gestures by pointing out all four numbers. Okay, so let me deconstruct that for you. She signs add all. And she gestures by pointing at all four numbers. So she has produced you know, a gesture speech match. And she did that, or the children do it on 80% of the problems. Is that a lot or a little? We didn't really know. So we went back to the hearing children to find out. And it turns out it's not very different. The hearing children gesture on 73% of the problems. All right, now here's a gesture speech mismatch. What the child does is she, she signs about adding up the numbers on the left side of the problem and putting that number in the blank. But at the same time, she produces what everybody recognizes as a gesture. She puts her hand over the seven as though to subtract it, to get it out of there. Um, so here, watch it. Okay, so what she's done here is she's produced an add to, uh, add to the left side of the equation in her sign, add to equal sign. But in gesture, she's also doing this subtracting of the seven, which is an add subtract strategy. It's different information from the uh, sign. So the proportion of children who produce greater than three mismatches out of six is 42% for the deaf children. Again, a lot or a little, we didn't know. But it's about roughly comparable to what we find in the hearing kids. But now the big question is, does it predict learning? So what I'm going to do here is show you <clears throat> show you where how many children learned as a function of the mismatches that they produced. So on the x-axis, what I have there is the number of children who produced zero mismatches, one mismatch, two mismatch, three, four, five, and six. And what I'm going to show you on the y-axis is the proportion of children in each group that succeeded on the problem. And to, on the, to succeed, they had to get five out of six correct. Okay. And if mismatch is predicting learning, the numbers should go up from zero to six. And if not, it should look like chaos. But in fact, it looks like gesture 
sign mismatches predicting who will learn. The kids who produce six mismatches prior to learning are much more likely to learn from that problem than the kids who produce zero mismatches. So this is sort of interesting. Um, we wanted to show, I'm gonna show you this in the same format that I show you. This is what I showed you originally for the hearing kids. The deaf kids look pretty much identical. Kids who produce mismatches, speech or sign on the math task profit from instruction. Okay, so gesture sign mismatch predicts learning as well as gesture speech mismatch does. And what that suggests, it tells us something. We've learned something from this. It's the just juxtaposition of two different representational formats rather than the juxtaposition of hand and mouth of two different modalities that gives gesture its power. That's not to say that the body doesn't matter. The body is clearly involved in gesturing, but it's not the sole thing that makes gesture interesting. Okay. So gesture serves the same cognitive functions, functions for signers as it does for speakers. All right, so just to briefly pull this together, language is resilient. When it can't come out of the mouth, it comes out of the hands, and it reveals the fundamental properties of mind that give shape to language. And why I like that study is because it really can tell us about the thoughts that can evolve without language. And it gives us hypotheses about the thoughts that may need language to evolve. Gesture is also resilient. It comes for free along with language, either speech or sign, and it often conveys ideas not found in language. So what our hands can tell us about our minds that we don't see in language. Um, sign tells us about which linguistic properties humans can create on their own, doesn't have to be handed down from generation to generation to generation. The emergence of sign language from home sign tells us about how learning can change those properties and how languages then change over historical time. And finally, gesturing accompanies language, speech, or sign, tells us about we, how we learn, but even more important, it tells us about how we general, generalize what we learn, because that's what learning really is about. We don't want to be just learning the one little thing that we're taught. We want to be able to take that knowledge and move it to other areas. So my bottom line here is that home sign and gesture provide an relatively unobstructed view onto the mind hidden in our hands. And we can talk about that in a bit. But what I want to do first is thank all my many, 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 many collaborators for helping me on this work um, and my funders and also thank you for listening.